Hello, and welcome to Talking Development. I'm thrilled to be recording this episode in Colombo, Sri Lanka. During my visit to Jaffna, I had the privilege of meeting remarkable women entrepreneurs who benefited from World Bank programs that empower women in business. I have said this before, and I will say it again. Women have the power to uplift economies. If women were employed at the same rate as men, global GDP per capita would be 20% higher. Just imagine the difference this could make for people and economies. Today, I am so happy to be joined by Kasturi Wilson, a trailblazer who shattered societal biases to become the first female CEO of Hemas Holding PLC, one of Sri Lanka's leading companies. Kasturi, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Anna, and it's lovely being here with you today. Kasturi, my first question to you is, uh, we know that gender equality and economic empowerment is so important for a country's economic development. Sri Lanka is going through a recovery from crisis. How do you see the role of closing the gap and empowering women in fueling this economic recovery that the country needs? So Anna, that's a very good question at this point for us because um, in any country, for a country to develop, the human capital have to, has to be actively in uh, productive economic activity. Women have to be out there. Uh, your data point of um, if the women are actively uh, involved in the labor force as equal to men, it'll be 20%. My reading for Sri Lanka, it'll be going over 30%. Um, and if we can get these capable resources deployed in economic revenue generating activities, the country would benefit and, and it's imperative. If we are to come out of this, we need to change it. But like any country, there's deep rooted biases and uh, cultural issues we face, like the region or in the world. But, but from Sri Lanka's standpoint, it's absolutely imperative that we do this. And women have to be out there. You yourself, so successful, became a CEO. I mean, this is such a great, great illustration of what a woman can do. What are some of the barriers the country has to address? And what made it possible for you to do it? Because I understand you're also a mother, like me. So you must have also throughout your career had to think about different phases and how to stay the track to actually become a CEO and not, as we often see, trail off at some point in your career and say, this is where I level out. Firstly, women coming into the workforce is not an issue. I think one challenge there is we kind of demarcate roles for women. That's where the biases or cultural pressures kick in. They expect um, the family unit is kept together by the mom or the woman. Mm -hmm. And society expects the man to go out there and do a corporate job or a job and be the breadwinner. The other side of it is a man who is a stay-at-home dad is not respected. So this burden of the stay-at-home caregiver is a mom. Now, in that context, how do you manage a career? So we take time off, um, even if they manage to get domestic help, the societal pressure of, yeah, but you're outsourcing your kids here. Growing up and you're like, you're a hands-off mom and you're not a good mom. Oh my God, I've had all these labels thrown at me. So those are the biases. Then when women actually transcend that, businesses or people around are very uncomfortable with a woman in leadership role um, because they kind of struggle with uh, authority and being feminine. They expect a woman to be feminine and soft-spoken, which is rightfully how we are, we are brought up or we are naturally. But when it comes to work, we kind of become quite firm. And it's very tough for a man who has, um, who operates and has a wife at home and expects the same feminine figure to, or, or the person, persona to be here in a boardroom. But actually the bigger challenge is women themselves, uh, owning their personality, owning um, the women lead, what a woman leader should be, or who she is as a woman leader, her style. Um, also owning her circumstance. I'm emotional, I'm passionate, and I see things differently. But sometimes they'll say, you're emotional, I say, yeah, but that doesn't mean it makes me, I own it yeah. because I feel 
more for the people. But I also am passionate and I, when I see things not going right, I would want everybody to huddle together to get things done. And yes, I don't connect the dots the way a man would because my brain is not engaged that way. But I get outcomes. But all this I address and I say, that's me and I'm not going to trade or try to behave a different way. I weirdly didn't want to be a corporate leader. I, I just, uh, I was a sportswoman. I was competitive. I wanted to do well in life. But my visualization of well was being married and having kids and being all there. And uh, when I started working, I was not going to give up my identity or I was not shy to say I'm a mom, I'm a single mom. And my kids become priority. And, I, and weirdly, when you state it out, organizations adjust. So I owned it, which meant I had flexibility to go when the kids needed me. I guess once you display that your commitment and your, your outcomes and performance, basically, they eventually, actually the biasness of certain roles, a woman, this is demarcated for a man, or I mean, industry is a male dominant industry, but a woman leader, whether she can do it or not, those kind of fade away. So that noise goes off and you kind of, your individualism comes out. Um, for example, today I, I'm moving out to a global organization that two entrepreneurs over there in the US. While they were wooing me, one thing I always said was my um, mom lives with me, she has dementia. And I need to be anchored around Sri Lanka. When I laid it out there, they said, okay, you can do it. So if we hide away from that, and I'm sure you would have had the same thing, um, I don't think we would be able to find a solution. So the other side of it is corporate should acknowledge it. If we can't, if we can't go back and change cultures at home overnight, we need to change this environment so that the women can flourish. Look, it's very, it's so insightful, uh, especially this issue of we have to sort of live within the circumstances we have and adjust and make accommodations and find solutions to make it possible. But there are three things you said that I have to say really resonate with me. The first one is, you know, how to balance career and having kids. I have to say it made me very efficient because I couldn't just sit around until like eight o'clock at night. I wanted to get home at like six because that my kids were young, you know, I have dinner with them. So I got very efficient and I think it stayed. That's one thing. Um, the second thing you said, which I think is something every woman feels is, I didn't intend to become a leader. Somehow we, we sort of <laughs> accidentally fall or it's like people see the potential in us and we may be just like following that. And I, I think it's, a, it's both a strength because it means you are who you are and you're being uh, recognized for the moment. And then there's this potential in you that someone sees and really kind of, you know, helps you. But that also assumes that there are people who are watching you. So it's, it's a little yeah. bit too That's risky okay. to rely on it. Yeah. So I always advise younger women to have a plan, you know, think about what you want to do. And then the third thing I think is the traditions. You know, you, you have a mother that you are living with, she's living with you, which actually drives what opportunities you can take and how you can take them. I have a mother in my home country, Sweden. I live in Washington. She's in a home, which is very different, but it's very Swedish. But it means I want to be able to stop over and see her. So when I travel, I always try to find a way, even if it's for 24 hours. So I think we have a lot of commonalities. But you mentioned sports and you said competitive which I think somehow might have something also to do with your success. When you reflect back, has sports played a big part in your professional life? I think, Anna, that's a, actually a great question is because I think it played a large part of who I am today as a leader and how I approach work or my corporate life. And I played basketball, netball and, and athletics and for Sri Lanka I did two of those, the team sports. It taught me that technically you have to do the same thing repeatedly with for micro changes to be excellent in things. So you're not f afraid of hard work and you know hard work, commitment, if you're passionate about it and you put your head down and do it, repeatedly you become great at it. Um, the second thing is that it taught me that you work for a bigger goal and everybody is diverse. Imagine in a team, you have to have different skills. My job was shooting, somebody had to defend. 
and a you have to get them really good at defense so you have to support somebody else to be great at their job so that we all can win and sometimes there are leaders without titles because i'm passionate and i'm i'm kind of i don't like to be second so you you know you you go out there i might not be the captain but i'm driving everybody as if like it's your default job it's your job that's because i don't want to lose like you take something on you want to do well so i guess you translate that into work is i don't need the title i just want everybody the company to do and doing well is not me doing well is eventually the results uh and the last thing is new stuff you're not afraid to you're not afraid to try you get back to the basics and think okay what does excellence what do you have to do to become excellent and you do that repeatedly without wanting overnight success it will happen eventually you lose so much in a team sport right you learn to pick up yourself so many times time and time again and that's corporate life i would have got kicked down so many times but i get up and the next day you're back on the same court and you're practicing to win another game so those things no university teaches you but you've done it you're ceo of a big company you don't have anything to prove to anyone or probably not even to yourself why now change and take this new uh, adventure <laughs> what do you what made you say yes <laughs> and what do you want to achieve in this job this <laughs> next job yeah yes yeah. so you're the first person i'm going to answer this publicly um so you know my i had two kids i was financially responsible for them and physically responsible for them and i actually provided for my parents in that circumstance i couldn't venture out and do things which were more entrepreneurial and the corporate setting was safe for me and i would get my salary and that's all i needed when you want to pay your bills and you get your kids and um i'm at a stage my kids are independent and um i have been with a corporate all my life um this is an entrepreneurial um business run by two entrepreneurs um and they don't build generational business they build value creating business so as i wanted to learn that and i was fascinated how they do it Second aspect is I wanted to do a global role. The last part of it was right um whatever they do they kind of donate 90% back to charity. For me over time I feel I wanted to give back a lot and a lot of um uh of my life is a kind of uh helping people to do better. Somebody did help me to be who I am and I and I wish I could, I'm in a place I can help lots of smart kids to be to live their dream. So it kind of had resonated with me and I thought look I'm turning for 55 next year I yes I have a contract which is lasting another seven years but if I don't take this risk now and and see the world and and then go out there yeah so it all fitted in at the right time and it's a risk but you know what I'm ready to take it and I thought you're never too old to change right and and try new stuff you know when you say i'm turning 55 i just turned 55 and i have really? to say i have the same mentality which is okay let me just explore that so yeah. i think you have absolutely the right uh, attitude we have a lot of women in the world bank who are at the earlier stage of their career what would be one piece of advice you would give them let's say a woman in her 30s uh, you know embarking on a career what would be a kind of one word or one piece of advice that you would say and this is a diverse group women from all over the world do whatever job role you're doing i always believe in trying to be excellent in that and um we overthink the tomorrow especially when you have other responsibilities and and if you take that attitude i guess um it eventually unravels for you One thing which worked for me is why well I did a functional role I was always curious of everything beyond that function. So just don't let curiosity die. Be curious about the overall bigger picture you're working in and just be great at your job. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me today. Here's my take. As we face ongoing global challenges, women are the solution we need. The women I have met are eager to work and create positive change in their communities while providing for themselves and their families. The data speaks for itself. With more women in the workforce and starting businesses, we can make significant strides in economic growth 
all while building a more inclusive and equal society. If you take away one thing from this episode, let it be this. Women are at the heart of development. The bottom line, countries cannot move forward if half of their citizens are held back. But the world is not on track to achieve gender equality. Now is the time to invest in women and girls and accelerate progress. For its part, the World Bank is placing gender equality at the very center of its mission to end poverty on a livable planet. And gender has been mainstreamed in our operations. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you next time on Talking Development.